Malware on Macs? Yeah, it's a thing. Spoof signatures are a problem in GNUPG, and a slew of backdoored images were found on Docker Hub. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire for June 19th, 2018. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, including that brand new Discord server, check out the Patreon link in the show notes below. And special thanks to our newest patrons, including Roland, John, Craig, Costi, and Lost Boy. And now onto the news. So a ton of information has been coming out from the Apple world of security and privacy, including a major flaw on Macs, as well as a security issue on iPhones that was recently patched by the company. So first we have the Mac flaw. So according to a cybersecurity firm called Okta, whitelisting services available on Mac computers could be bypassed, which would allow malware or other harmful code to infect machines. So according to a post by engineer Josh Pitts, malicious code could look like it was signed by Apple, but was really malware that would bypass the third-party developer usage of a code signing API. Now, while Okta has not seen real-world examples of malware infecting machines by bypassing the whitelisting programs, they also explain that they haven't tested all of the programs that are available, so it's entirely possible a program has not been patched yet. The flaw affects Facebook's OS Query, Google's Santa, and Yelp's OS X Collector whitelisting tools, as well as Chronicle's Virus Total, Carbon Black, F-Secure's X-Fence, Objective Development's Little Snitch, and Objective C's What Your Sign and Lulu. All but two have patched their services as of time of recording. So this affects third-party implementations of Apple's digitally signed code API specifically for universal and FAT files, and the attacker has to use those binary formats for it to work. The code signing bypass flaw was found on tools that weren't using Apple's API properly, and each of them could sign malware as if it was coming from Apple. Once again, the attacker could gain access to data on the infected computer, so if you are using one of those tools, just make sure to update as soon as possible. Apple also recently announced that they will be sending out a software release that will cut off one of the easiest ways for law enforcement to extract data from iPhones. It's called USB Restricted Mode, and it will soon be available. This will shut off access to data through the iPhone Lightning port after the phone is locked for an hour. This data extraction could have been used by phone thieves, identity thieves, and even law enforcement as well. Now, while Apple did explain during this announcement that it's not to put a bane on law enforcement, it's definitely going to deter from unlawful extractions of data. The update will protect against Celebrite forensic tools and will force a user to unlock their phone every single hour with their passcode to transfer data, but they can still charge it anyways. Now, while it should protect against gray key as well, that little law enforcement black box of doom, Grayshift actually has spoken in email saying that they've already bypassed this update, but whether or not this is actually the case is yet to be determined. It's unknown which version of iOS will have this new update available publicly, but when it is available, definitely do an update. On June 13th, a programmer named Marcus Brinkman found what he dubbed SIGSPOOF, which is a flaw that affects GNUPG as well as several different platforms that use GNUPG, including Enigmail, GPG Tools, and Python GNUPG. Now, this is a critical vulnerability, so it has been indexed as a CVE with number 2018-12020. It would allow for an attacker to spoof the digital signature of any person with a public key that's out in the public data database as long as that user was using the open PGP standard that relies on GNUPG to encrypt and digitally sign their messages to other users. So this flaw has been in the code since the existence of GNUPG, very, very far back, so more than a decade. It's really old, which means that any previously encrypted messages could have been from a third party, not the actual user that you expected it to come from. And since digital signatures are generally seen as proof of the originator, this is a major, major flaw. 
Worse yet, digital signatures aren't just used for email messages from one user to another. Think about data backup validation, software updates, these all use signatures to validate the originating source. Now this comes just a month after eFail, which showed problems with PGP and SMIME, which we also reported on, where an attacker could force encrypted messages to show a plain text body of text instead of the encrypted non-human readable text that you would normally see if you did not have that private and public key to decrypt encrypt it. In SigSpoof's case, it's a flaw in input sanitization, which is when the input is modified to ensure that the encryption or digital signature is valid. It's usually combined with something called input validation, which checks the input to see if it meets a set of criteria, and both are used to ensure the input is in the correct format and is actually signed correctly. Now with six spoof, the attacker could spoof the public key without having the private key on hand of a user at all. Metadata that is hidden and stored in the encrypted message would be the source of the attack and applications simply see the metadata as a valid signature and as such, they don't bring up any kind of red flags for the users. It's all good. Now from the researcher's post, it quote, allows remote attackers to spoof arbitrary signatures via the embedded file name parameter in open PGP literal data packages. Packets. Each of the affected tools has been patched as of Monday, with additional patches being released for similar bugs in Enigma and Simple Password Store. Now the good part is, this bug only affects tools where a setting called verbose is physically turned on by the user in the gpg.configuration file. It is not set by default on any of the tools. The verbose setting with GNUPG allows for troubleshooting bugs, and it's often used by advanced users with lots of access to data on a network which could be a bad thing. Now in this case, as well as the additional bugs with Enigma and Simple Password Store, updating to the newest version of the application will ensure that you aren't vulnerable. Brinkman recommends removing verbose from your gpg.configuration file, but also not using it in the command line, which would be gpg tac tac verbose, and upgrading to GNUPG versions 2.2.8, 1.4.23, Enigma 2.0.7, or GPG Tools 2018.3. Devs should also add tac tac no tac verbose to any GPG usage and upgrade Python GNUPG to version 0.4.3. Brickman's easily readable blog entries are linked below with more mitigation techniques for users as well as developers. Docker Hub, it's this super popular cloud-based platform which allows for devs to access open source image repositories. Users of this platform can contribute to and use these repositories as needed, and folks generally utilize Docker repositories typically to run configurations on top of operating systems. These repositories are super popular because they can save system administrators a ton of time. So it makes complete sense. This past weekend though, Docker Hub users were exposed to 17 images that contained backdoors, which allowed for a criminal or a group of criminals to have made $90,000 USD over the past 10 months. The 17 backdoored images were downloaded over 5 million times. So that means that these images are spread over many different machines and used by potentially millions of people. The user or the group account docker123321 uploaded three publicly available images that contain secretly nefarious code for mining cryptocurrencies. Go figure! These images were created in July and August, and then in September, a GitHub user complained that one of the images contained a backdoor, but Docker Hub did not remove the images for eight months. That same user then created 14 more nefarious images, and these did not go unnoticed. Sysdig and Fortinet are two different security firms, which caught different attacks coming from the Docker repositories. The first report from Sysdig did not see any changes until Fortinet reported the issue in May. It took Docker Hub a month to fix these issues. So the timeline of all of these events were mapped out by the security firm Chromtech, and it took over a year for Docker Hub to pull the images that were maliciously crypto mining currency from Docker's new subscribers. Researchers were able to find a wallet address which showed that the images had mined 545 Monero digital coins. So that's a lot of money, as I mentioned before, equating to about $90,000. 
Chromtech went on to warn developers of the dangers of using publicly available code that is provided by public sources. So it's always important to stay on top of backdoor announcements and make sure that you did not install images that are infected with malicious code. For the users who had downloaded the images while they were available on Docker Hub, you could still be running the malware on your systems. They provided a list of the 17 packages that are infected in their blog post, and it is very wise and crucial to check and make sure that you are not running any of them. Patrons, make sure to share your favorite stories in the community tab or on Discord. Every Friday, I will pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's show. Patrons also get access to a downloadable audio version of the show, first looks at show topics, polls, discussions just for patrons, behind the scene photos, and now that Discord server. And that Discord server is just for patrons at $2 per month and up. So join now to get access to all of these and help support the show. And our next milestone goal is super close. That gets you access to a live video Q&A just for patrons at all levels and gets us closer to doing a second episode each and every week. And honestly, there's so much security news right now. I would love to be doing a second episode each week for you. And a big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them. These two are brand new. Keep them coming, they're adorable. Hit the subscribe button or share this episode on your favorite social media page as well. And again, I am Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet.